Hi everyone at Restore. I'm Suzanne Potter and I'm a missionary with uh, Latin Link and normally based in Guatemala. Hi, I'm Rachel from the Living Room in Tenerife. My name is Andy Vaughan and my wife Lynn and I are leaders for one of our campuses at Youth with a Mission, San Diego Baja. One of the things I love about being a part of Latin Link is that we're an international mission agency and uh, every four years we get together for an international assembly and during that conference uh, we usually have uh, worship together in which we often sing in three or four different languages at the same time. I don't mean that we have one verse in English and one verse in Spanish, uh, but we actually sing uh, simultaneously, different people in the in the group, we sing simultaneously in three or four different languages. And for me, it's always a real uh, encouragement to me that we are part of a much bigger family and the diversity amongst us is something that we can celebrate and we don't need to learn another language in order to uh, worship God. I'm reminded that we who live in diverse cultural environments get to see a small picture of what it will be like when every nation, tribe and tongue are worshipping the Lord together. The word unity comes to mind and stands out to me. We will all be unified under one God and recognising the salvation that he has brought to each one of us. Part of what we do out here is going out, talking to the, the young people in the clubs and the bars of Las Americas. And, you know, we get a lot of different people from different nations. We mainly work with British, but there's also Spanish, Latvians, Lithuanian, Bulgarians, Italians, um, just so many different cultures and people here. Um, we have people from Nigeria as well, um, and Senegal, and just all around the world. And so obviously these verses about um, imagining a great crowd when that day comes, that we're all stood before God, that we're all seeing him stay face to face. I often just imagine when things get hard here or when you question sometimes why you do what you do. One of the reasons for me is this scene and it's imagining all the people that you've spoke to over the years, looking around that place and seeing them all there as one, part of a great multitude of people and imagining them praising and shouting, salvation comes from our God. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and tribe and from every people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. time where differentness often brings separation. I love how there's an obvious sense of different people coming together to worship God. We live in a world that is massively divided at the moment. Here in Zambia, the divisions might look different than in the UK, but they're here. Diversity is such a beautiful thing, but it often brings about complexities and we have to work hard to be unifi unified while embracing our differences. Yet yeah, I'm struck by verses in the New Testament that talk about oneness with God and oneness with each other. I think that when we look at God, when we worship him together, that often unity is created. In the midst of division and differences, worship can often unify us together before our good and our wonderful Father. One thing that I love about worship here in Zambia is that no instruments are needed to worship together. The most beautiful worship is when it's voices only and clapping together. It's like we touch heaven in those raw times of worship as we unite together to worship our Father. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Restore Living Room. Thank you for joining us. We've come to the end of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And traditionally, on the last Sunday of September, we focus on the nations. We celebrate the nations. For the last four, three weeks, we've been connecting, first of all, with God. And then the second week, we spent connecting with one another, celebrating our unity. And last week, we talked about connecting with our community. We looked at ways we can be praying for and connecting with our community. Now today, in the spirit of 
Acts 1 verse 8, I'd like to talk about connecting with the nations. Ian referred to Acts 1 verse 8 that we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We did that in the first week, waiting on God, and then we celebrated connecting with one another, and then with the community, and then, of course, beyond to the nations. Now, we get our legitimacy from Acts 1 verse 8, that we receive power to be witnesses where we are and beyond. As a local church, we become legitimate when we're involved beyond ourselves in our community and in the nations. It's like a cup on a saucer, uh, and then on a table, when you overflow the cup, it's our relationship with God is resembled in the cup or represented in the cup. And as we overflow in our relationship with God, and, and we don't stop waiting on God or connecting with God in the first week of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, that carries on. And as we overflow in our relationship with God to one another, out of the overflow of that into our community and into the nation. So today I'd like to do two things. First of all, I'd like to talk about God's heart for the nations. And then secondly, our response or our responsibility to God's heart for the nations. And I'd like to pick up the story in Genesis 22, where Abraham is about to offer his son Isaac. You might remember the story. Uh, God uh, promised Abraham and Sarah a son. They waited 25 years for that son. And then 15 years later, Isaac is probably 12 to 15 years old. Uh, so it's 40 years from, from the promise. Uh, God challenges Abraham to offer his son back to him. Now, in the period when Abraham and, and, and Sarah were waiting for Isaac, uh, the Bible says that Abraham hoped in God against the hopelessness of their situation. When they were promised that they'd have a, a big offspring, uh, they were old already, and it was beyond, uh, Sarah was beyond childbearing age. And the Bible says Abraham hoped against hope for the promise. Now, that sounds like complicated English. That's because there are two kinds of hope. Abraham hoped in God against the hopelessness of their situation. Now, that might be a word for someone out there that you might find that you're in a hopeless situation. I'd encourage you to keep hoping in God in spite of your hopeless situation. But back to Abraham. Abraham's about to offer his son Isaac, Genesis 22. And as Abraham... Now, Abraham trusted in God. Abraham probably didn't understand why he needs to give his son back to God, why he needs to sacrifice his son. But because he feared God and honored God, he was willing to trust God in spite of the fact that he didn't understand. Again, that's another word for us in these times when we don't understand everything that's going on, to still fear God and trust God. But you know the story in Genesis 22, as Abraham's about to sacrifice his son, God speaks to him through an angel and stops him. The angel says, don't lay your hand upon the, your lad, upon the lad, because now I know that you fear me because you've been willing to obey me. And we're all relieved at the fact that God provides a ram for Abraham to sacrifice. And uh, Isaac is not sacrificed. Now, the story continues because the angel spoke to Abraham twice. Maybe you don't remember that from the story because we're so intrigued by the fact that God rescued Isaac but the Abraham actually spoke a second time. And I'd like to emphasize that. In Genesis 22, verse 15, we read the following. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. And then he goes on to say that I will make your offspring, your descendants as the stars of the, the sky and the sand on the seashore. And then he says, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. So we see the emphasis there that God promised Abraham that through his offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that's our emphasis today, blessing the nations of the earth. But I'd just like to pause there and just, show, just point out the fact that God used very strong language when he spoke to Abraham. He said, I swear... By myself, says the Lord. God took an oath as he made this promise to Abraham. Now, if you and I had to go to court as a witness or as an accused, we'll have to swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Now, I was once in court as an accused. It's a long story. I was accused of 
being involved in a, a political assassination. Now, that sounds very laughable. Uh, it's laughable now, but it wasn't very funny when I was subpoenaed to appear in the, the high court in a nation in, in Southern Africa. It wasn't South Africa. What had happened is a political activist had been assassinated, and I was implicated in the plot of that assassination. Now, as I say, that sounds very lawful, but when I came to the point in court where I had to say, I will speak the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God, as I had to make that, that oath, I made that a real prayer. I said, so please, really help me God, which God did. I was only in the dock for 20 minutes. The judge realized that, I, that the, the accusations against me were false, that I'd been framed, and he apologized to me for wasting my time and dismissed my case and excused me from the court. Now, why do we have to make an oath when we go to court? Because we are unreliable, because we tell lies. But why did God have to swear? Why did God have to make an oath? Now, we don't have to speculate because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 6, verse 17. Let's have a look at that. It says, because God wanted to make the unchangeable nature of his purposes very clear. Some, some versions say the un, immutability of his counsel, the unchangeable of his purposes, very clear to the heirs of what was promised. Now, we're the heirs of the promise that came to Abraham. He confirmed that promise with an oath. Now, if you look at some of the preceding verses, it says, I think in verse 14, it says, God, when he made this promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one else, he swore by himself. In other words, God took his name, the fact that he's the uncreated, the sovereign, almighty God of the universe, with all that authority, he put his authority on the line, he put his name on the line, when he made this, this promise to Abraham, that through your offspring I will bless the nation's of the earth. He wanted to confirm to us, the heirs of that promise, that he's serious about blessing the nations of the earth. I can't overemphasize the fact enough that God is serious about blessing the nations of the earth, and so should we be serious. If I backtrack a little and pick up the story of creation in Genesis 1, in Genesis 1, verse 27 and 28, it says that God created us in his image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, people in Restore are good at doing that, at multiplying and filling the earth. And we, we celebrate the Radmore baby that was born. In fact, we celebrate every pregnancy and every birth, every child that's born. But God emphasized there, first of all, that he created us in his image. And let me again pause there. You and I are of the God kind. We are not little gods, but we are godlike. We are different from the rest of God's creation. We are not of the tree kind or the mountain kind or the star kind or the planet kind or the river kind or the animal kind. We are of the God kind. God created in his image, and God's desire and God's heart was that people carrying his image, would fill the earth. He wanted us to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth so the whole earth could be filled with the glory of God, people carrying the image of God. That was his heart. And then as we read in Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, we read the story of Noah and the flood. Because people became evil, they weren't representing what God had wanted them to represent. Uh, he destroyed them, and except for, for Noah and his sons and their wives, God really started over. And that, that, that period was like 1,650 years, I think it was, to the flood. And then another 700 years later, uh, people had then multiplied again from, from, from Noah and his family. Uh, over, after another 700 years, we come to Genesis chapter 11. And you might remember the story of the Tower of Babel. What happened with the Tower of Babel? We, we read there that people wanted to build a city. Let's look at, at Genesis 11 verse 4. Come, let us build ourselves a city, they said, with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a, make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. I want you to see that. 
These people wanted to stay in one place and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And of course, that was contrary to God's purpose. God wanted people to be scattered, to fall the whole earth. Some people think God was nervous because people were now building a tower. They were going to dethrone God. No, that wasn't why God confused the languages. He very simply wanted people to spread out over the whole earth. And then in Genesis 11, Tower of Babel with the different languages, he created all the different language groups of the earth. And people were then forced to, to spread out in different groupings, different families, different peoples. And that's where the different nations or ethnic groups come from. Genesis 11. And then Genesis 12. We pick up the story with God and Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3, God makes this covenant with Abraham. And he says to Abraham, go out of your father's house to the place that I will show you. And then he says to him, I will make you a great nation. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's in Genesis 12, verse 1. God makes this, we call it the Abrahamic covenant. Now, the first 11 chapters of the book, that's kind of the introduction of the story. Genesis 12, God makes his purposes known that he wants to bless all the nations of the earth. And the rest of the Bible has to do with the unfolding of that plan. That in, and then in Revelation 7, verse 9, we read that there were people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. As they, as these things, after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And it says that they were all clothed in white robes with palm branches singing, Salvation be unto the Lord, unto God, and unto the Lamb. Just imagine that people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, every language group, gathered together in white robes, worshiping God now, I'd like to suggest our worship of God and of the Lamb will only be complete, is only complete, when it's gathered together from all the tribes and all the nations and all the different expressions of cultures. And as we, as we worship together in different cultures, then our, our worship becomes full and complete. Now, when I say complete, I don't mean final or finished because we're going to keep worshiping for eternity. It's going to carry on and on and on. What I'm trying to emphasize is the overwhelming em emphasis of the Bible. The overwhelming revelation of the Bible is that God is concerned for all the peoples of the earth and all the nations of the earth. And he's not only concerned for us as groupings of people, that too, that's the emphasis here, but also as individuals that make up parts of those families of the earth and those nations. Of course, John 3 verse 16, uh, we know that very well. For God so loved the world, the entire world, all the people of the earth that he sent his only begotten son. If we believe in him, we have eternal life. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul is writing to Timothy about prayer, to make prayer a priority. And then he says in verse 4, he says, For it is God's will that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So God's heart is for the nations of the earth and one day we're going to celebrate people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. But as we join together now and do that in our different cultural groupings, our worship just becomes so rich and honoring to God. God's heart for the nations. Let's move on to our response and our responsibility to God's heart for the nations. Last week, Matthew Chow referred to the last commandment and the last commission. Now, the last commandment is that we love the Lord God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Jesus himself said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And as we love one another, that in itself becomes an evangelistic tool as we reach out beyond ourselves with our love for one another that communicates about the love of God. But the great commission, or the last commission, we read in Mark 16, verse 15, and it says the following. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, it doesn't mean we have to preach the gospel to the trees and the birds and the bees and the animals. 
to the entire human race, to preach the gospel. And when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the good news of Jesus. Jesus himself said that the Spirit of God is upon me to, to preach good news to the poor, the gospel, the good news to the entire human race. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We have a responsibility to preach the good news to every single person on earth. Now, when I was born in 1950, there were 2.5 billion people on earth. Today, in 2020, almost 70 years later, they tell us there are now almost 8 billion people on earth, 7.8 billion. In other words, the world's population has trebled just in my lifetime. I'm just thinking, at what rate have I, or have we reached the world just in my lifetime? But the challenge is the nations and every individual on earth. At this point, I'd like to introduce you to what is called the Christian Magna Carta. We're all familiar with the Magna Carta, the great chapter of, of freedoms written in 1215, and on that we base the, the uh, parliamentary democracy in the UK, and many nations have, have made, built their constitutions on, on the, the Declaration of Human Rights that comes out of that. But I'd like to introduce you to what is known as the Christian Magna Carta. That that shows us all the rights that people have that are implicit in the gospel, and it helps us to just evaluate where we're at in terms of reaching the nations. It helps us to, to prioritize and just to respond to the gospel. Point one on the Christian Magna Carta is everyone on earth has the right to hear and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to, to encourage you to make sure you can tell your story of grace your story of coming to know Jesus, your story of salvation, uh, and, and any other stories of grace where God interjected, intervened in your life. We all have stories of grace. And I'd encourage you to be able to tell a story or the story of salvation and other stories of grace in, in 30 to 60 seconds, because sometimes that's the only opportunity we have when we're in conversation with people, just to drop the seed and tell our story of grace. I'd encourage you to do that. The second point on the Magna Carta is every person on earth has the right to have a Bible available in their own language. Now, I don't know how many Bibles that you have on, on your shelf at home. But you know, there are many people in the world that don't have a Bible in their heart language, in their own language. When we were in Mongolia as a, with a restore team last year, last summer, uh, first of all, we were intrigued by the fact that Mongolia is actually a young nation uh, they, they came out of 70 years of communism in 1991. And at that stage, the, there were only a handful of believers, maybe five or six Christians in the nation. Today, there are over 100,000 believers in Mongolia in, amongst a population of 3 million. Still small, but still 100,000 that have come to know the Lord. But what, what fascinated us is that over 50% of the people that are currently believers in Mongolia came to know Jesus through reading the Bible the power of the word. Let's not, not underestimate the power of the word and make sure we do all we can to pray and give that people's, uh, people can have the Bible in their own language. Uh, many Bible societies and organizations are working together currently to, to eradicate Bible poverty by the year 2035, that there'd be a Bible available either in print or, or in uh, 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 electronic form for all the, the, the languages in the world. The third point on the Magna Carta is every person has the right to have a place of Christian fellowship nearby. Now, I would want to bet that there are many places of Christian fellowship near you, either a church or a small group within walking distance of you. But that's not the case all over in the world. Many people don't have a place of Christian fellowship nearby. That's why we are called to church plant, to plant small groups, to make sure we're involved, that people have a place where they can fellowship together. And even in this lockdown time, we miss those times of fellowship and we have to create other ways to connect together. But that's implicit in the gospel, that we can have that place of connection and, and fellowship together. The fourth point on the Magna Carta is that every person on, on, on earth has the right to have Christian education available for their children. Now, at this point, I'd like to affirm and honor 
all those people in Restore that are working in Christian education, those that are head teachers and assistant head teachers and teachers and assistant teachers, those are, we even have people in Restore that cook meals for kids in schools. And during this time of lockdown and the, the difficult challenges at schools, we need to be praying and investing in the schools. When we think of Zambia and our involvement in Zambia with the community schools there, and uh, uh, that's implicit in the gospel that those kids that were in communities where didn't have schools, that's their right to have good Christian education available. And praise God, he's using us to be able to fulfill some of those needs. I keep praying for the team there. We think of Dan and his team that are, are, are working on Jolly Phonics and that's being test trialed in a province in Zambia. And if that works, it's going to roll out to the whole nation. So let's be praying and, and investing. In fact, you can, you can be involved in sponsoring some of those kids. Uh, you can connect with Jody and beyond ourselves, and, and we can be involved in that part of fulfilling the Christian Magna Carta in Zambia. The fifth point on the Magna Carta is that every person has, has the right to have their basic needs of food, water, clothing, shelter, and health care met. When we went to, to Mexico last year to meet with uh, Andy and Lynn Vaughan working with Homes of Hope, we were able to, on behalf of Restore, build a, a home of hope for a family. And they don't only build homes of hope, but they create communities of hope. And, and hopefully next year we'll be able to take a team there again. This time next year in September, we'd like to take a team to Mexico to build two homes of hope. And then the, the last point on the Christian Magna Carta is that every person on earth has the right to lead a productive life of fulfillment spiritually, mentally, socially, emotionally, and physically. And there are many people in Restore with our community uh, efforts involved in some of those areas. But that's just a quick list of ways we can pray through and ask God, am I involved in any or all of those? And what ways can I be more involved in? I'm convinced that as we involve in reaching out to the nations, by, by praying for the nations, by giving towards the nations, by going to the nations, by engaging with the nations, because God's heart uh, and he put his name and his authority on the line is to bless the nations of the earth. We can expect God's blessing. When you engage with the nations in any one of these ways, it's like you, you invoke the blessing of God upon your life. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing beyond ourselves and a blessing to the nations. Another place we read of the, the Great Commission is Matthew 28, verse 18. And 19 to 20, it says, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So when we go out, we function in the authority of Christ. Therefore, go and make disciples, again, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I don't have time to develop that verse too much further, except to say, that the imperative command in that verse, in that command, is to make disciples. It says, as you go, as you preach, as you teach, as you baptize, make disciples of the nations. Again, these groupings of people that were created in Genesis 11, that we need to disciple every grouping on earth. Now, how do you disciple a nation? Not just by having a, a live stream on a Sunday, but by living out godly kingdom principles in everything you do in your life. And may God help us to be kingdom people and live out, whether we're working in education or in business or in whatever activity we have, to live out godly kingdom principles to see his kingdom come. As I start concluding, I'd like to challenge you, first of all, to consider how more you can engage with the nations. Through praying for the nations, through giving towards the nations, and through going to the nations. Secondly, how you can live out being a kingdom person, living out kingdom principles where God has placed you in the workplace, wherever you work, to make sure you're living with integrity and the life of Jesus, as he said, as my Father sent me, I send you to be the light of the world. How can you be a kingdom person person and live out kingdom principles right where God has placed you. And then lastly, very practically, I'd like to encourage you to connect, to make friends with someone from another nation than your own. Make friends with someone from another nationality 
Even here in the church, let's make friends with one another. Let's connect with one another in a deeper way. In your neighborhood, I'm sure there are many different nationalities just living in your neighborhood. They tell me that in London alone, there are three different lang- 300 different languages spoken. So maybe God's laid one of those languages on your heart. You can find someone right here in London. We don't necessarily have to go to the nations. They are right here with us. Make friends with people in your neighborhood, in your workplace, here in the church. Let's connect with the nations and in that way receive the blessing of God upon us as individuals, but also as a church. I'd like to end off with a blessing and talk about the top line and the bottom line of blessing. When we talk about the bottom line of blessing, or bottom line, when you get a bank statement, the first thing you look at is the bottom line. How much do I still have in my account? Am I in the black or in the red? When we think of the bottom line of blessing, we think of us being blessed, God blessing us. But God's way of blessing is the top line, being a blessing to others. And let me just read Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2 to you, and then we're going to pray it together. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2. It says, May God... God, may you be precious or be gracious to us. So we're going to pray this together. God, may you be gracious to us and bless us and make your face shine on us. Now, that's the bottom line of blessing. We want God to bless us. We want God to smile over our lives with approval. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation amongst the nations. We can't legitimately pray verse 1 if we don't also pray verse 2. God wants to bless us so we can be a blessing to the nation. So will you join me there where you are? If you can, pray it out aloud. Let's pray that together. God, would you be gracious to us and bless us and make your face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation amongst all nations. God bless you. Keep safe. Keep trusting him. Amen.